Doug, uh, don't you think we should put on some music for these folks to relax them a little bit this moment? What 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 were we playing earlier? Jump around. <laughs> I think I think that might be the right fit for the three MT, the the pre presentation jump. Here we go. Are you controlling the the music? Um, not the music itself, but the, the volume of the music. Because yeah. oh. I was thinking, I had the song, thank you. You know the ACDC song, uh, TNT? Yeah. It's so stuck in my head because like 3MT. Yeah. TNT. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of lame, but. No, yeah. it's not. It's, it's, uh, I'm actually doing that other time. So as long as, like, basically, as long as, like, yeah. this stuff is oriented up, like, picture, like, a big ball around this. Understood. Yeah, yeah. But I did rig it up last time, so it was like, I don't know, I did something insane. But something, yeah. something off the wall. Yeah. <laughs> up. Thank you so much, man. Thanks. Watch me. Cool. Thank you. What's your name again? Max. Max? Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah. Nice to meet you. And best of luck. Oh, thank you. I, uh, my goal is to not embarrass my supervisor too much. Ah, you got it, you got it. She's in the bag already. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not an MTF. Yeah. These, uh, these slanted floors are really interesting. You want... Should we... <laughs> Should we get black too? <laughs> <laughs> Do you see uh, Austin Powers? <laughs> I, won't, I, won't I have seen it. <laughs> and I'm going this way. <laughs> Don't be mad, I should slide into this opening shot. I'll be like, we're going to be like Sean from Andre's event. That's production quality. Oh no. Shit. I have a secondary mute button. You're really a main cursor you fits today. All right, four minutes, three minutes. Right on here. Oh, perfect. I have three minutes to figure out how to put this on my pants. <laughs> Is that you? Is that you playing the microphone?
Should we just collectively put our hands together? There. It's 1.59, folks. We're almost ready to go. Have a wonderful time. Have fun. All right, Doug, are you going to turn off the room music, please? Awesome, thank you. All right, bonjour tout le monde. And on behalf of Fourth Space and all of the organizers behind the scenes, welcome. Concordia University's Fourth Space is activated through live events such as today's to create engagement around the various research projects happening across the university. We are therefore so very excited to be able to welcome all three minute thesis participants in person for the Mathez en 180 secondes competition without further delay. It is my great pleasure to pass the floor to your moderator today. Jessica Murphy, welcome. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2022 Concordia Three Minute Thesis Competition. My name is Jessica Murphy, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies for today. Bonjour et bienvenue au Concours Mathes en 180 secondes. Le dixième à être tenu ici à Concordia. Mon nom est Jessica Murphy, et je serai maître de cérémonie aujourd'hui. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganya Gahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chojake, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Thank you so much for tuning in to support our participants today. After two years of holding entirely virtual 3MT competitions, we are thrilled to have our presenters all together in the same room performing live on stage in front of our judges and to you, our audience at home. As a participant in last year's competition, I can appreciate the challenge and importance of translating research to a general audience. I remember sheepishly walking into my first 3MT coaching session, not quite sure what I was getting myself into. But by the time the competition rolled around, I could not wait to say, hello world, here's my research, and this is why it matters. To our presenters today, you should feel the same way. You've worked so hard to make it to this stage, so have fun out there. I know you will all do great. And to our audience, we are excited for you to hear the presentations today and learn in three minutes or less about some of the outstanding research taking place at Concordia. Here is a brief overview of our program for today. We will start with the doctoral presentations in both English and French. We will then invite you, our viewers, to vote for the winner of the Doctoral People's Choice Award by completing a Zoom poll that we will post. We will then continue with the master's presentations, which again will be followed by a voting period for the People's Choice Award in the master's category.
While the judges deliberate, we will have a Q&A period with our presenters to get to know a little more about their research and 3MT experience. So we encourage you to use the Zoom chat to post any questions you may have for our presenters today. And finally, when the judges have made their decision, they will announce the winners. I would now like to welcome Dr. Rachel Berger, Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development, to say a few words. Thanks, Jessica, and hi, everybody. So we are delighted to welcome you to the 11th edition of the Three Minute Thesis Competition and Mathez en 180 secondes competition at Concordia University. Over the past 11 years, the Three Minute Thesis Competition has brought much pride to Concordia. We, and my, include myself in this we, have had the pleasure of coaching students on their research pitch and being on the other side of the table judging their communication skills. We have watched our students develop jargon-riddled, rambling, cryptic scripts into compelling, thought-provoking, and inviting stories. Thank you to all our coaches over the years. For those listeners who are tuning into, the first, uh, for, to, into their first three-minute thesis competition, I would like to take a moment to provide a little background on this international event. This annual competition started at the University of Queensland in 2008, but it quickly became a worldwide event. Now this competition is held in approximately 900 universities in 85 countries. The competition has also been adapted to other languages, including the French version, Ma thèse en 180 secondes. The challenge of the three-minute thesis program is for graduate students to clearly communicate the essence and the importance of their research to a non-specialist audience with just one static PowerPoint slide that you'll see on the screen over there. Imagine spending long months or years toiling away at your research, then having to squeeze it into a three-minute summary without diluting it or omitting major points. It's a challenge worthy of any scholar. According to the University of Queensland, it takes almost nine hours to present an 80,000-word thesis. And despite our growing ability to sit through nine hours of the latest Netflix series, I doubt anyone is up for a nine-hour thesis presentation today. This year, we invited all our graduate students to participate in the competition. 47 students joined the 3MT coaching, and of those, 21 finalists have made it to today's competition. After the presentation, our judges will select a winner and runner-up in both the master's and doctoral categories. You, the audience, will also have the opportunity to vote for a People's Choice Award in both the master's and doctoral categories, which Jessica will explain after the participants' presentations. From our finalists, the judges will select one student to represent Concordia University at the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools 3MT competition in April and the 3MT Eastern Regional Final competition in June. Our Francophone presenter will rep represent Concordia at the ACFES competition in May. I salute all the participants for their courage to accept this in-person challenge, especially after two years of remote communication. I wish them the best of luck in their time to shine. Now I'll invite Jessica, our doctoral runner-up and People Choice winner from last year's competition to introduce our judges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berger. I would now like to, like to introduce you to our esteemed judges who have graciously accepted to give us their time this afternoon they have the tough job of selecting today's winners. Our first judge, Susan Tantawi, is a Concordia University alumna with a specialization in biology and over 15 years experience in drug development and toxicology. Following her graduation in 2006, Susan joined Charles River Laboratories where she held various positions in inhalation toxicology and project management for six years. She then joined a drug development project management company where she assumed the role of project manager across all stages of development. Susan is currently senior director of toxicology and non-clinical development at Galecto Biotech, a clinical stage Danish biotech company specialized in the development of novel small molecule therapeutics for the treatment of various fibrotic and oncology indications. In her role at Galecto, 
Susan designs and manages all non-clinical toxicology studies ranging from early discovery work to late stage studies, supporting the continued clinical development of the company's assets. Our second judge, Dr. Philippe Cagnon, received an MA in translation in 1991 and a PhD in linguistics in 1996 from the Université de Montréal. He is an oral traducteur, terminologue et interprète agréé du Québec, or OTTIAQ, certified terminologist and certified translator. In 2014, he was promoted to the rank of full professor in the Etudes Francaises department here at Concordia, where he teaches terminology and translation and was nominated as Academic Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. In addition, he was appointed to the position of Associate Dean Student Academic Services in the Faculty of Arts and Science in September 2019 and Co-Administrator in November 2019. For the last eight years, Philippe has volunteered to work as the Editor-in-Chief of Circuit Magazine, the official journal of the OTTIAQ. Our third judge is Aiden Matlabi, a multi-talented humanitarian and artist specializing in humanitarian projects locally and internationally. He has been working in the humanitarian field for over 15 years and creating art that empowers communities surmounting wars. Over his career, Aiden has worn many hats where his role varied from fundraiser, project manager, marketing strategist, researcher, war photographer, and many more. Aiden creates art projects with communities surmounting war and violence. His art has been exhibited internationally with the solo exhibition at Montreal's Museum of Fine Arts. He acquired multiple awards, one being the humanitarian artist of the time. Aiden balances his life between humanitarian missions and using fine arts to impact change. We thank you all for your time this afternoon and are honored to have you as our judges today. Now, before we jump into the presentations, I must tell you that there are rules in this competition. Participants can only have one PowerPoint slide without animations. They cannot use any electronic media or props. Their presentation cannot exceed three minutes and the judge's decision is final. So how will the participants be judged? Well, based on three criteria. Comprehension. Did the presenter make you understand their research and its impact? Engagement. Did the presenter draw you in and inspire you to know more? And did their slide enhance the presentation? And communication. Did they spend enough time on each element of their presentation? And how was their delivery? And there is money on the line. Both winners at the master's and PhD level will receive an award of $750. The runners up in each category will receive $150. And the people's choice winners in both the master's and doctoral competitions will each receive $100. We invite you to join the conversation on social media and post about this event using hashtag Canada3MT, hashtag 3MTCU2022, and tag us at GradProSkills on Twitter or Instagram. We will now start with the doctoral presentations. In this category, we have a total of 15 presenters, 14 in the English competition, and one in the francophone competition. Let's wish all of the participants good luck. Our first presenter is Simon Dubay from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Simon is pursuing a PhD in psychology. His thesis title is Toward Aerobotics an investigation of the social, personality, and state factors influencing the motivation to engage erotically with sex robot. And his three-minute thesis title is, To Love or Not to Love a Robot? That's the question. Good luck, Simon.
At the end of a beautiful evening, your perfect date puts down their drink and seductively invites you to the bedroom. Following their lead, you take their hand and stare into their eyes. Then you realize this is a machine. And it dawns on you, would you have sex with a robot? Could you fall in love with a machine? Advances in artificial intelligence and robotics are giving rise to sex robots. Some argue that these machines will destroy love and sex between humans. Others propose that they will widen access to pleasure and companionship. Yet these debates currently lack both theoretical and empirical scientific evidence. And this is where my research comes in. My thesis launched a new unified scientific field of research dedicated to the study of human-machine erotic interaction. We call this field aerobotics. And to ground this new discipline, my thesis is divided in two parts. The first one is theoretical. It defines aerobotics and proposes a theory of how humans and erotic machines influence one another. The second part is empirical. It tested aspects of this theory by exploring why people may want sex robots and the factors that may influence their willingness to have sex or fall in love with these machines. In a series of three online studies, we discovered that people would buy sex robots for reasons like pleasure, exploring fantasies, or because they struggle with pain, disabilities, or finding intimate partners. Yet we also discovered that there exists a stigma associated with the use of sex robots, a stigma which can make some people feel ashamed of their interest in these artificial companions. Together, this suggests that whether it be to spice things up in the bedroom or to help with some difficulty, there are plenty of good, highly personal reasons for you to potentially desire sex robots. Like many other aspects of human sexuality, some may disapprove of your choices or partner preferences, no matter how beautiful the evening was. So, stare again into those eyes and tell me, would you have sex with a robot? Could you fall in love with a machine? Answering these questions is important, given that one day, your perfect date might not be human. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Our second presenter is Rebecca Garner from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Rebecca is doing a PhD in biology. Her thesis title is Tracking microbial diversity in Canadian lakes over large spatial and temporal scales. And her three minute thesis title is Back to the Sediments Lakes as Time Machines. Good luck, Rebecca. Have you ever dreamed of traveling back in time? If you had a plutonium powered DeLorean, what time in history would you visit? I suggest that time travel is possible and with zero risk of becoming your own grandparent. Your time machine is a lake. Over time, sediments accumulate at the bottom of a lake, burying the biological remains of the fish, zooplankton, and microorganisms that make up the lake's ecological community. We collect a sediment core, capturing the layers on layers of sediment, which chronicle the lake's history. Our time travel journey begins in the surface sediment, which integrate materials from the current day lake ecosystem. As we move deeper into the sediments, the deeper into the past we travel. Until recently, scientists studied a limited fossil record in the sediment. My research builds on the emerging science of paleogenetics to reconstruct past lake ecosystems using DNA preserved in sediments. By studying ancient DNA, we can travel hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of years into the past to observe communities as they were before okay. humans altered the natural world. 
I am specifically developing paleogenetic techniques to track human impact on microbial communities in Canadian lakes over the past 200 years. The first step of my research was to pioneer an application of DNA sequencing to uncover the diversity of microorganisms that existed in the pre-industrial water column. This is no easy feat because living microbes thrive in the sediment subsurface, so their DNA has to be disentangled from the ancient DNA archive. So far, I have discovered that the DNA of some freshwater bacteria and viruses is preferentially preserved. While discovering this ancient DNA is in itself a gateway to studying microbiology over extended timescales, the next step of my research is to understand what the microbes from the pre-industrial past can tell us about the environmental conditions that prevailed 200 years ago. Return now in your time machine to the surface sediments and the year 2022. Right now, lakes are under unprecedented levels of stress from pollution and climate change. As a scientist in Canada, the country with more lakes than any other, I believe it is our imperative to understand how the history of human impact has affected our freshwater ecosystems. If we want to keep lakes open for swimming, to safeguard drinking water, and to protect freshwater biodiversity, then we should travel to the past with paleogenetics to understand what the future holds for our freshwater lakes. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Our third presenter is Amy Atkinson from the Faculty of Fine Arts. Amy is pursuing a PhD in art education. Her thesis title is Exploring Excellence Through Art Teacher Voice in Secondary Visual Art Education in International Schools. And her three minute thesis title is Upgrading Art. Good luck, Amy. Did you know that the IQ is declining? Some scholars theorize this is because our educational focus is on more linear test based subjects and we're letting creative subjects diminish. Before I began my PhD, I was a visual arts teacher and I have seen the diminishment of visual arts within our schools over the past 15 years. I've seen struggles of students trying to choose creative subjects sorry. This also has serious repercussions on our ability to maintain and attract the next generation of art teachers. This is also in direct opposition to calls from industry for more creativity, which is one of the top skills necessary for future employment. So in my studies, I'm looking at excellence in art education, and what I'm trying to figure out is what can we do to elevate the study of arts in our Canadian schools. Interestingly, in international schools, visual arts programs are thriving. There is a small group of diverse students studying a rigorous curriculum created by the International Baccalaureate. And even though visual arts is still an option, over half of all IB international students choose visual arts. Research tells us more than anything else, it is teachers that has the strongest impact on student achievement. And if students are shown that they are capable of achieving excellence, they are motivated and engaged. So specifically, I want to look at art teacher voice. For my methods, I'm going to start with data collection and survey to identify these international teachers that are having the strongest impact. Using them as a focus, I'm going to conduct a series of case studies and interviews going into the classroom and exploring their behaviors, analyzing their methods, their strategies and their philosophies. From this, I want to find out what is it that these teachers are doing in the international schools that is creating this high quality environment where students are motivated and engaged. Now, I know my study won't raise the IQ overnight, but we also know that teachers learn how to and are inspired to teach by observations of their own teachers. And this creates an imbalance in favor of those who are able to experience high quality schooling. So what I want to do with my research is to create a sort of roadmap for all teachers, a kind of guide that we can use to upgrade teacher training. This will level the playing field 
and provide diver opportunities for diverse teachers to start at a working level of excellence. If we can put our focus back on our creative subjects in our schools, we can transform the lives of students, eventually raise that IQ, and build a more creative future. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Our next presenter is Duray Raju from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Duray is pursuing a PhD in mechanical engineering. His thesis title is Detection, Isolation, and Characterization of Extracellular Nanovesicles for the Early Stage Diagnosis. And his three minute thesis title is Can a Drop of Blood Save Life? Good luck, Duray. Twelve years ago, my friend Arun was diagnosed with cancer, but he was diagnosed too late. Later, within a month's time, he passed away. And this is the common problem. It is not that we can't cure cancer, but quite often we diagnose it too late. My goal is to develop methodologies for an early stage diagnosis, which is accessible, affordable, and faster and not depending on tissues at the two site. Nowadays, we do routine blood tests to find out our sugar level and cell content, but this blood contains several vital components. These are called the nano messengers and travels between the cells and exchanges information. These cells, these nano messengers compared to cells are 100 times smaller in size and 100 times more in number in a drop of blood. Therefore, it is challenging to separate them from the blood. As part of my research work is to develop methodologies to selectively capture and detect these nanomessengers from the blood. The developed method involves few steps. Firstly, forming gold nano islands on a glass surface and then activating these nanoparticles. Secondly, attaching these nanomessengers onto these activated nanoparticles. At this stage, when these activated nanoparticles are shined by a light, a specific peak wavelength will be appearing. Once these nanomessengers attach to these nanoparticles, a further increase in the wavelength of these particles are observed. In the lab, I conducted several experiments to see if I could selectively capture and detect them, and I could do this. The whole process can be completed in three hours and, and in, from a drop of blood. The next step is to validate this method for further clinical application so that this could be potentially used for a routine test by everyone. Unfortunately, my friend passed away as he was diagnosed very late. However, his legacy reminds me and inspires me to find out methodologies for an early stage diagnosis and save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Duray. Our next presenter is Alexander Albury from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Alexander is pursuing a PhD in psychology. His thesis title is The Interaction of Musical Complexity and Hedonic Response in the Context of Motor Learning. His three-minute thesis title is Why Enjoyment Matters for Music Learning. Good luck, Alexander. Have you ever tried to learn an instrument? It can be a painful process. Imagine a screeching violin with a hesitant plank of piano keys. Think of struggling through scales and exercises, sometimes excited by your progress, sometimes just wanting to give up. Why are some pieces of music easier to learn than others? Are these songs objectively easier 
Or is there something else going on? I study how our subjective opinions about music affect how we learn to play an instrument, with a focus on two aspects of music, predictability and liking. A song could be easier to learn because it's more predictable, meaning it more closely matches our expectations, so it's easy to plan what to play next. It might also be easier because we like it. It appeals to us and gives us the motivation to learn to play it well. I want to understand how these two features, predictability and liking, interact to affect how easily people with no musical experience learn to play the piano. Contrary to what you might think, the most predictable music isn't necessarily the best liked. If music is too predictable, it's boring. But if it strays too far from expectations, it can end up sounding strange or confusing. I want to understand how these two features interact to affect how easily people with no musical experience learn to play the piano. This connection between predictability and liking sets the stage for my experiment. I started by creating short melodies that vary in how predictable they are, some really simple, some more complex, and everything in, in between. Once I had these melodies, I could bring people into the lab and have them learn to play them on piano. Because I'm interested in liking too, I also asked people to rate how much they like each melody before they try to play it. Using these liking ratings, I can divide the melodies into highly liked and less liked melodies and compare people's performance on each. What I expect to find is that people make fewer mistakes on melodies they like, even if they're less predictable. That is, even if something's objectively more complicated, as long as you enjoy it, the level of complexity won't matter for learning. This would indicate how important enjoyment and motivation are for learning in music, and may even suggest that how much you like something can override how difficult it is to learn, a finding that might apply to other kinds of learning too. And maybe with this new understanding of music in the future, learning an instrument can be a little less painful. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Our next presenter is Hashem Al Musa from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Hashem is pursuing a PhD in biology. His thesis title is Insight into Trap 2 Assembly and Function Through Characterization of Naturally Occurring Trap Gene Variant. His three minute thesis title is Traffic Jam in Our Cells Compromises Brain Development. Good luck, Hashem. Did you know that roughly 100,000 flights take off and land every day all over the globe? Did you know that a bigger number of flights take off and land every second in every cell inside your body? Cells are small factories that make proteins. These proteins need to be transported into another destination within the cell for them to do their job. A fleet of airplanes like molecule called vesicles transport our proteins into different destinations within our cells. These vesicles or airplanes need to be tightly regulated. Or guess what? If any problem happens there, our delivery system will fail. Failure in our delivery system can cause serious illnesses to human. Imagine on a cold day, you're flying south to enjoy a warm vacation, and you end up in Toronto. Pretty bad, right? Or, in the best case scenario, you will be late. Several genes in our body are important to guide these vesicles so they could land at the right destination, and most importantly, on time. I study two of these genes. If any one of them is sick, we might have serious problems with our delivery system. And this could cause neurodevelopmental disorders and intellectual disabilities in growing children. Think of these two genes as the airport tower, which establishes the initial contact with airplanes and gives them directions before they land. My two genes are part of a system known as the trap complex, which also establishes the initial contact with these vesicles and gives them directions before they land. Now, what is exactly that I do? So I take cells from sick children who have mutations within their trap system, and I study their delivery system. 
I mainly study how much time it takes to deliver a package between two different locations within their cells. Using advanced microscopy, I observed that these cells take longer time to deliver their packages, affecting multiple processes within their cells. Because of this delay, these kids are intellectually impaired. They have speech impairment, autistic features, and aggressive episodes. But there's some good news. I also observed that treating these cells with a drug holds some hope to bring this system back in order so these kids are no longer late. Thank you. Thank you, Hashem. Our next presenter is Ezgi Ozionam from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Ezgi is pursuing a PhD in education. Her thesis title is Dismantling the Colonial Patterns in the Narrative of the Internationalization of Higher Education at a Central Canadian University in Quest of Decolonizing Internationalization. Her three minute thesis title is is international education a form of colonialism? Good luck, Isge. Canada is a global international education leader. Like hundreds and thousands of others, I move here to get a degree. What if I told you that international education is spreading colonialism? Okay, okay, let's back up a bit. International education and colonialism. Colonialism is more than land conquering. It involves control over people's language, ways of knowing and identity. And international education regenerates this dominance. As a result, there is unequal movement of student mobility, mainly from the east to the west. This dominance increases global inequalities and spread academic colonialism. This is where my research comes in. I reimagine the international education differently. Firstly, my research identifies colonial patterns in the narrative of international education. To do so, I gather data from, from university strategies, promotional materials, and reports of international offices. I also interview staff faculty, international students to learn from their perceptions. My research centers people's knowledge and experience. In the second part of my research, I rethink international education. I use a conceptual mapping method. It's a tool to map various perceptions on a phenomenon. In my case, is the phenomenon of international education. After my research, I aim this conceptual map to foster dialogues, conversation on this topic. Let me leave you with this idea. The current international education is spreading colonialism and we need to stop it. My research helps to interrupt colonial patterns and reimagine its future. I'm currently collecting data and I can share you this. I advocate for inclusive international education. Let me highlight this word, inclusiveness. Isn't it what we should be spreading? Thank you. Thank you, Eski. We are now halfway through the English doctoral presentations. Our next presenter is Sho Wu from the John Molson School of Business. Sho is pursuing a PhD in Business Administration Marketing. Her thesis title is 
two essays on consumer well-being and gender and physical freedom. Her three-minute thesis title is When Self-Tracking Backfires. Good luck, show. Are you trying to lose weight? Have you ever compared yourself to fashion models? Do you track your weight, exercise, or diet? Research show that more than 60% of Canadians regularly track their health on their phones or smartwatches. And scientific studies have found that by monitoring our body, self-tracking helps to achieve our health goals. However, the negative impact of self-tracking have received little attention. For example, how we feel about ourselves and our body. I propose that self-tracking can lead to self-objectification. Let me explain why. During self-tracking, we evaluate our body from an observer perspective. And relatedly, self-objectification occurs when we treat ourselves as objects to be viewed or evaluated based upon appearance. And this behavior leads to self constant self-criticism. Why? Because meeting the thing or muscular ideals immediately is impossible for most people. But at the same time, we keep comparing our body to Victoria's Secret Angels. That's why most men and women, especially women, remain stuck in our goals and repeatedly feel bad about ourselves. And this constant negative feeling results in body shame, depressed mood, and eating disorder. To find a solution, I will use multiple methods. In one lab experiment, all participants will exercise or consume food, but only half of them track that information. I will also use field studies to collect data over 16 weeks in order to see the long-term impact of self-tracking. So, how can we maximize the benefit and minimize the damage of self-tracking? I propose that we should stop promoting controlled motivation, meaning that we focus on external reasons for change. For example, if you motivate yourself by saying, I want to lose weight because I want to look good in front of others, then you are more likely to feel bad about yourself. So back to the questions I asked you in the beginning. If you ever compared yourself to fashion models, try to empower yourself by saying, I want to lose weight because it's important for me to feel healthy and energetic. Most importantly, you've been criticizing yourself for years and it hasn't worked. So starting today, stop looking at your body as objects, but start to feel its need. Thank you. Thank you, Sho. Our next presenter is Victor Casada from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Victor is pursuing a PhD in chemistry. His thesis title is Novel Rare Earth Metal Organic Frameworks and Their Potential Application in a Catalytic Photooxidation Reaction. His three minute thesis title is New Hope for the Degradation of Mustard Gas, a Chemical Weapon. Good luck, Victor. Have you ever heard about the chemical warfare agent named as mustard gas? Well, I'm conducting research on a material that can degrade it. Mustard gas is actually an oily liquid which was used in the world wars, deployed as a fog, which in contact with the skin produces large blisters, and if inhalated, it's deadly. Regardless that this substance was banned its manufacture in the early 90s, it still posed a large threat to the public health and to the environment because there are countries that can still produce it. And it also exists large stockpiles of mustard gas which are hidden deep into the sea, in bunkers under high surveillance, and what is worse, buried underground. Therefore, it requires a sustainable destruction, not just by burning it. And how do we achieve sustainability? is by producing a change at the molecular scale of mustard gas to generate a non-toxic product using a process that is fast and that requires very little energy. And here is where my research steps in. In the laboratory, I have discovered a new material 
which when synthesized, it seems like a fine powder, but if you look at it under the microscope, you realize that forms well-shaped crystals, like the diamond on a ring, but of the size of the tenth part of a millimeter. Each of these crystals actually have a porous structure, so they can be thought as a sponge, but with billions of pores. Each one of these will allow the molecule of mustard gas to be absorbed and trapped very, very fast. And once there, I can shine ultraviolet light, energy that will be absorbed by the structure of the material and make oxygen to react with the molecule of mustard gas, oxidizing it and producing a non-toxic product. This reaction is completed only within 12 minutes, making it very fast, and it only requires an economical ultraviolet light LED setup, thus also requiring very little energy. I will keep conducting research to understand from a fundamental point of view what are the parameters that make uh, such good performance, but also how can I make it better by changing different components inside this material. It will be my dream actually in the future to develop a procedure to synthesize these crystals in a large scale so they can be used at the stockpile site of mustard gas. And I have already demonstrated that it's safe to be exported so other countries can also use it to destroy their own mustard gas and also the one that could be probably confiscated. So I would like to provide with a technology that will end up the hazard of this substance around the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Victor. Our next presenter is Cassandra Goldfarb from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Cassandra is pursuing a PhD in psychology. Her thesis title is Habenula in the Regulation of Striatal Circadian Clock. And her three minute thesis title is The Importance of Circadian Clocks. Good luck, Cassandra. How many of you have ever called yourselves a night owl? How about an early bird? Well, what if I told you that this depends entirely on your biological clock, your circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythms are the 24 hour processes of everything that goes on in the body. From when you go to sleep, to when you wake up, to when you get hungry, even when you have your highest attention, maybe actually be able to knock off a couple of those to-do list tasks. Circadian rhythms function because we have clocks in nearly every single part of the brain and body. And these clocks communicate to remain in sync. And it's through this that we're able to achieve what's called homeostasis, or overall health and well being. Now, the question you're probably asking yourselves, and the one that I'm interested in studying, is what happens when these clocks aren't in sync? If one of them isn't working properly? Well, current research points towards the relationship between clock dysfunction and psychological disorders. In order to dig into this, I targeted one specific part of the brain that acts as a sort of on off switch for dopamine being made and released into the rest of the brain. Dopamine being of such importance here as it's a central messenger in the brain, playing a vital role in pretty well everything we do. Our ability to learn, motivation, reward, even me being able to walk around right now. And when dopamine fun isn't functioning properly, there's a link to a number of vital disorders, things like addiction, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease. So to dig into this, using a mouse model, we injected a virus into that on off switch. This virus binds to the gene that's responsible for keeping the clock rhythmic. And then in theory, it turns it off. So to assess how this impacted behavior, mice underwent a variety of behavioral tasks that's associated with dopamine functioning. And what we found, when this clock was no longer functional, behavior did change, specifically motor control. These mice lacked the endurance of typical mice, and even more so, their coordination was drastically impacted. Meaning that when this one clock in this one small part of the brain was no longer able to send rhythmic on off signals for dopamine to be released, behavior changed. So what do we know? 
We know that changes in dopamine is related to disorders like Parkinson's. And we know that we all have biological clocks. So maybe that missing link in understanding how the brain works and why sometimes it doesn't work, maybe that missing link is in the clock. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Our next presenter is Morteza Zangene Surush from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Morteza is pursuing a PhD in Information System Engineering. His thesis title is Emotions, Mood, and Stress Recognition in Designers Using EEG Signals. His three-minute thesis title is Green, a Gift by Design Lab. Good luck, Morteza. It's me, 36 years of age, and with a lot of challenges like you, with a lot of ups and downs in my life. I've been living in a difficult situation. I have worked as a firefighter, as a police officer, teacher, university lecturer, researcher, a student. And through these years, I was just involved with stress, anxiety, deadlines, projects, homeworks. And what I needed was intelligent assistant and friend to help me and to assist me in the best possible way. With that in mind and motivated by these green, fabulous color of nature, I tried to just uh, make it real and uh, create my own assistant. I started four years ago and I tried to develop this system. I participated in more than 1,000 training hours and then I participated in workshops. I tried to implement my system. I collected EEG data from different sources and then I created Green. Green is an intelligent assistant which works on brain signals and video images and photos. It captures your brain signals, your body signals, like ECG, GSR, and EEG, and then it analyzes your photos and videos, and then it detects your anxiety, the stress level, and also your mood. And then it's not over. Green can learn. Green can learn from you in more than, in less than like uh, 100 hours. And then gradually it can learn and it can be your best friend, your best assistant. Are you stressed out? Are you running out of time? Okay, go for a walk, grab some coffee, and then Green can help you. Green is always there for you. Green is AI with which you can make love, but you cannot have sex. And also, Green is your future intelligent assistant. Did you know that autism, uh, autistic people, and people suffering from ADHD cannot express their feelings, their emotions? Green can help them. Green can help children increase their performance. Green can help business owners to increase the performance of their companies. Green can uh, help the elderly to detect their emotions, to detect their anxiety. And this, two days ago, Gina Cody, my role model, just talked about AI. And now it's my pleasure to introduce your future assistant, Green. Thank you. Thank you, Morteza. Our next presenter is Vrinda Nair from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Vrinda is pursuing a PhD in physics. Her thesis title is Drug Design of Small Molecules Implementing Deep Learning Model. And her three minute thesis title is Do You Want the Bacteria to Get Smarter Than Us? Good luck, Verinda. All right. 
Do you know that I have sent a lookout notice to all the bacteria out there on an urgent basis? Yes, you heard that right. Now you might ask me, why did I do so? Let me ask you something. Do you want the bacteria to get smarter than us? Well, I don't think so. Imagine you pop an antibiotic for an infection, believing that it will kill those life-threatening bacteria out there. But wait, our antibiotics aren't working like they used to. What does that mean, you ask? It means bacteria are developing the ability to defeat the drugs which is designed to kill them. Yeah, look at the audacity of the bacteria, right? And that's what we call as antibiotic resistance, which is also known as antimicrobial resistance and is one of the biggest threat to our global health, which can affect anyone of any age in any country. Yes, it's difficult to think of yet another large-scale global health crisis occurring in our lives. Having said that, the production of new antibiotics have also slowed down while the bacteria are gaining resistance to existing drugs. You know, according to a new estimate, more people died of antibiotic resistance than malaria needs in 2019. But don't you worry, I'm here to focus on this issue with my research. I'm on my part towards developing novel antibiotic hybrids which will have double the power of an antibiotic and also designing new rules for bypassing antimicrobial resistance. In short, the overarching goal of my project is to create powerful antibiotics very soon. But how am I doing it? Well. There's a secret to it. I'm technically putting computers to work for us. And the good part is, I've got a superman, artificial intelligence for our rescue. Now, how is AI helping me, right? Yeah. So I'm actually teaching my computers how to think, which means I'm feeding my computer with lots of different type of drugs and guiding it to give me something similar to antibiotics. So what would happen in this way? Let's imagine that my computer imitates a way as human learns a certain type of knowledge, which is by learning examples. And with my research, it will learn through all the different type of drug molecules that I feed it. And ultimately, in near future, we're all set to discover new powerful antibiotics. After all, we don't want to witness yet another large scale global health crisis. And instead, we, we uh, hope to save many people's life in future. And yes, we are not letting the bacteria win over us. Thank you. Thank you, Verinda. Our next presenter is Varda Nassar from the Faculty of Fine Arts. Varda is pursuing a PhD in art history. Her thesis title is Against Their Own, Representations of Ethnic Linguistic Minorities in State Museums in Pakistan. Her three-minute thesis title is Moving Beyond the Stereotypes, Potentializing the Museums in Pakistan. Good luck, Varda. Imagine, imagine being a young child and walking into a museum in your hometown. A museum that in its very name claims to be national. And so the expectation is it will represent the entire nation. Instead, you encounter an image of yourself and your community that makes you pause and wonder, is that how they think we live? Is that how they think of us? This experience of being misrepresented in a museum is neither uncommon or an accident. In fact, it is a deliberate attempt which is rooted in how the British colonizers framed the savage native to justify their rule and is now being employed by various military regimes in my nation state of Pakistan. So in my research, I look at three museums as my case study. They were built from 1970 to 2016 and patronized by various military regimes. I look at how these museums connected and represented any given historical moment in which the military's regime and rule was challenged by ethnic minorities and how the spatial and visual technologies evolve from museum to museums to tackle these moments of crisis. These moments of crisis vary. They can be the demand for a province for an ethnic minority, the right for self-determination, or 9-11 and making and framing an entire community as possible terrorist. So, in my research, 
I start making these connections between real life forms of violence and dispossession and misrepresentations in museums. I look at ethnographic rooms and dioramas. I look at colonial writings, autobiographies, biographies of dictators. I look at museum publications, and then I see the connection between perception and misrepresentation. Museums have not been investigated enough in my country, but I want to potentialize them. I want to potentialize them for the child that once was me and tomorrow will be my daughter. Thank you. Thank you, Varda. Our next presenter is Maxine Ionocelli from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Maxine is pursuing a PhD in psychology. Her thesis title is Failure Feedback and the Development of Gendered Beliefs about Intelligence. And her three minute thesis title is Let's Talk Smarts. Good luck, Maxine. If I asked you to think of someone who's brilliant, think of a genius, someone with high intellectual ability, who comes to mind? Well, more often than not, even today, we're more likely to think of a white man. And this is true for adults, but it's also true among children. By the age of six, girls already believe that they're not as smart as boys. And not only that, but these kinds of beliefs are already affecting their choices and their behaviors. By six years old, girls start avoiding games, activities, and opportunities that are believed to be for really, really smart kids. So it's not hard to imagine how such early learned beliefs could ultimately be leading to the problematic gender gaps we still see today. But where are these stereotypical beliefs coming from? That's the question at the core of my research project. And we know that the messages we hear early in life play a pretty important part in shaping the way we start to think about our abilities. In other words, our mindsets. But we don't have a super clear idea as to what these messages actually look like. So what are kids really hearing from the people in their environment? And importantly, in the context of my research, are those messages gendered? Are girls and boys hearing different messages about their intelligence? Now, while there are many potential sources of gendered messages in kids' environment today, think the media, their peers, teachers, their siblings, and this list can go on. I'm focusing in on one potential factor, the messages they get from their parents. So we invited over 150 kids and their parents to join us over Zoom to do some fun, but pretty challenging puzzle activities, and basically recorded the feedback that their parents were providing to see if there is a gender difference in the types of messages kids are receiving. We think that girls might be more likely to hear that intelligence is, they need to work hard, put in the effort to be just as smart. While boys might be more likely to hear that intelligence is this natural, innate gift that they just have. These are still hypotheses that are yet to be confirmed, but it'd be an absolute pleasure of mine to follow up with anyone here who'd be interested as soon as I have my results. The findings can have far reaching implications for children. By addressing gender stereotypes at their developmental root, we start to get a better chance of putting children on equal playing fields. The goal is to stop the transmission of our own gender biases to our children so that when they think of a genius, a much more diverse population comes to mind. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. This concludes the doctoral presentations in English. Notre participant pour la compétition francophone est Louis Lazur de la Faculté des Arts et Sciences. Louis complète son doctorat en biologie. La titre de sa thèse est Cognition et gestion des mammifères mésoprédateurs interagissant avec les humains dans les aires protégées. Le titre de sa présentation pour la compétition Ma thèse en 180 secondes est Trouble fait en génie incompris la cognition des rétons le verre dans les airs protégés. Bonne chance, Louis. Au Québec, la cohabitation entre humains et ratons laveurs peut parfois causer des frictions. Que ce soit en fouillant dans les poubelles de la ruelle, en mettant en bas sous la galerie du chalet, 
ou en vous dérobant de la nourriture en camping, les ratons laveurs jouissent ou plutôt souffrent d'une réputation de trouble fête très futée. Les gestionnaires de, de parcs nationaux québécois se frottent à un épineux problème, protéger et respecter la faune sur son territoire tout en assurant une expérience agréable et sécuritaire aux visiteurs. Afin d'avoir des mesures de gestion bien appropriées à ces espèces problématiques, il faut bien comprendre leur comportement. Justement, mon projet de doctorat vise à étudier la résolution de problèmes et l'apprentissage chez les ratons laveurs. Afin d'étudier ces habiletés cognitives, je soumets aux ratons laveurs en nature des casse-têtes. Oui, ils doivent résoudre deux types de casse-têtes. Une boîte métallique avec une porte et un loquet, et deux tubes qui glissent un sur l'autre, où il faut aligner deux trous. Afin d'attirer des participants à mes expériences, je leur fournis des appâts très, à, très alléchants, sardines, nourriture pour chat et guimauve. Mes caméras infrarouges installées sur les arbres autour permettent d'épier leurs moindres gestes et ainsi je peux mesurer leur taux de succès, le temps requis, le nombre d'essais et le nombre de comportements différents qu'ils exhibent. Un de mes premiers résultats est qu'un des deux types de casse-tête se résout dix fois plus souvent que l'autre, ce qui indique que pour des tâches en apparence équivalente, un va donner beaucoup plus de fil à retordre au raton laveur. Et ce qui souligne également l'importance d'utiliser plusieurs tests différents pour étudier la cognition animale. Contrairement à une de mes hypothèses, les ratons qui vivent dans les campings, donc plus exposés aux humains, performent de façon similaire à ceux dans les aires de préservation qui vivent plus loin des humains. Également, plus un raton laveur utilise de comportements et de gestes différents, plus son taux de succès va être élevé. Finalement, il semble y avoir un lien entre le temps qui passe et le nombre d'essais et le taux de succès, ce qui indiquerait un apprentissage chez les ratons laveurs. De façon plus large, mon projet vise à amener l'étude de la cognition animale en milieu naturel, parce que de cette façon-là, on peut prendre en, en compte la complexité écologique dans laquelle s'expriment ces comportements. De façon plus précise, je souhaite amener des pistes de solutions aux gestionnaires d'air protégés afin d'amener une, co une cohabitation beaucoup plus harmonieuse entre humains et ratons laveurs. Merci. Merci, Louis. This concludes the doctoral category presentations. Thanks so much to all the presenters for the very engaging presentations. We will now give you a few moments to vote for your favorite doctoral presentation on the Zoom poll. Please scroll to the end to see the full list of participants. And don't go away, we will be back shortly with the master's presentations.
Hello, everyone. We are back in action, ready to start the master's presentations. There will be six presentations in total. Let's wish the participants good luck. Our first presenter is Tanaz Sadigian from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Tanaz is pursuing a Master of Science in Chemistry. Her thesis title is LCMS MS based label free peptide centric quantitative proteomics of the H2O2 stimulon in wild type S cerevisiae cells versus those deleted for the H2O2 sensor CCP1. Her three minute thesis title is The Story of an Incredible Orchestra. Good luck, Tanaz. I want to introduce you to an orchestra. But this one is a little different from any you've experienced before. I want to talk about a highly trained and well synchronized orchestra in the cell. Yes, in the cell. In this orchestra, proteins are like musicians that play different roles in different situations. And like any other orchestra, they need a good conductor. But life is sometimes challenging for us and for ourselves. Cells assimilate chemicals that proceed to aging and aging related disease. But have you ever thought how our cells coordinate their defense against toxins? In my thesis, I address this critical question. Why? Since aging and its related disease like cancer and neurodegeneration are among the most ongoing challenges in society. Every day we fight aging and its process by consuming antioxidants, vegetable, dark chocolate, my favorite. But let's see what's happening in our cell facing a chemical. Human cell and yeast cell often respond to chemicals similarly. So I choose yeast cell as the model. I added a chemical named as peroxide to these cells to induce the chemical stress. Then I analyzed the proteins of this cell. Interestingly, I noticed that a protein named as cytochrome C peroxidase, abbreviated as CCP, rolls like an orchestra conductor. To confirm that this protein is the conductor of the orchestra, I use the cell without CCP. Leaving the orchestra without conductor, the musicians, which are mostly antioxidants, showed a non-synchronized response to stress. My result give us new insight into proteins that have a role in chemical response adoption. Also, these results demonstrate the role of maestro CCP in coordinating and controlling the antioxidants in cell after the stress. Healthy aging require the coordination between the conductor, which is CCP, and the musicians, which are antioxidants in the cell. So next time, that you're taking an antioxidant, think of the great orchestra within your cell that is helping you to combat the chemical stress and prevent the aging process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanaz. Our second presenter is Amir Nasami from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Amir is pursuing a Master of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering. His thesis title is Atomic Layer Deposition of Nanomaterials of Sulfur Cathodes. And his three-minute thesis title is A State-of-the-Art Coding. Good luck, Amir. On a blistering cold day in January, you start up your electric vehicle after visiting the mall. Sitting inside the car, you are greeted with the familiar chimes. Unexpectedly, a robotic voice states, low battery. Glancing at the dashboard, your heart rate spikes. The estimated remaining mileage is lower than the calculated distance to your home. In the field of battery material research, we want to curb the fear known as range anxiety by improving reliability. How do we calm this fear? According to an electric vehicle survey, over three fourths of Canadian consumers would not consider going electric without a minimum of 400 kilometers on a fresh charge. 
Some experts suspect we are approaching the physical limits of current generation batteries, and so scientists are looking at new potential materials. One candidate, lithium sulfur, has the potential to store much more energy. Unfortunately, it faces some key issues, the low conductivity of sulfur and the production of corroding chemical intermediates. My project is to apply a specialized coating onto the surface of the cathode, the positive side of the battery. This technique is called atomic layer deposition. Let me paint you all a picture. The sulfur coated cathode is like a canvas and a gaseous reactant brushes particles onto the surface. From the deposited coating, I can expect an improved ch charging rate and battery capacity thanks to more charge carriers and less unwanted chemical intermediates. This approach could bring lithium sulfur batteries one step closer to commercialization and lead to a more reliable battery. My hope is that the next time someone finds themselves out shopping on a cold, harsh winter day, they won't have to worry about the dreaded range anxiety thanks to this unique coating and the lithium sulfur battery. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Our third presenter is Clara Gepner from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Clara is pursuing a Master of Art in Digital Innovation in Journalism Studies. Her thesis title is Assessing the Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on the Productivity of Francophone Print Journalists in Canada. And her three-minute thesis title is Journalism in the Time of Corona. Good luck, Clara. I'm sorry to do this, but let me take you back to March 2020. COVID is making headlines, we're all a little on edge, and then bam, lockdown. Suddenly, we're all stuck at home, and we're depending on journalists to bring us news of the scary outside world. But many journalists were also stuck at home having to manage their workload with their personal lives. Being a curious journalist myself, I started wondering what impact the pandemic was having on them and whether women journalists were unequally affected. Why would they be, you ask? Well, lockdown measures like school closures have been accused of turning back the clock on gender equality, forcing women back into traditional caretaking roles. Even before the pandemic, many women were forced out of the field when they struggled to balance uh, unpredictable work hours with raising of ch their children. The problem is that the people who make the news impact what and especially whose stories are told. So if the pandemic is forcing women out of journalism even faster than before, we stand to lose even more diversity of perspectives and voices in the media. Now, let me take you back to my research. Um, to, compare the, uh, to measure the impact that the pandemic was having on journalists, I compared the number of articles written by journalists at three major Canadian outlets during the first three months of the pandemic to the same three months in 2019. And then I interviewed six journalists from this sample to determine what was happening behind and especially beyond the numbers. And what I discovered surprised me. Women were actually more productive while, men, while men's productivity declined. And what may be in part happening behind this is that women traditionally cover health and education stories. And that's pretty much all there was to talk about at the time. But uh, the women I interviewed also expressed that although they felt overwhelmed by the added homeschooling if they had children, and they were also extremely worried about the virus for themselves and their families, they also felt responsible for keeping the public informed. And so that made them work harder and faster, and sometimes even in the middle of the night. Now, what this means for their future is uncertain. Will this increased productivity lead to faster burnout? Will they leave the field 
or will they stay now that they know they can weather the storm? Only time, and maybe another study will tell, but what I hope is that this data helps show that women can and should be journalists, whether they have children or not, and that we can depend on them in times of crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Clara. We are now halfway through the master's presentations. Our next presenter is Parul Singh from the John Molson School of Business. Parul is pursuing a Master of Science in Finance. Her thesis title is Water Risk Analysis Against the Stock Returns and Accounting Performance of Publicly Traded Firms. And her three minute thesis title is Water Disasters Impact on Companies. Good luck, Parul. We always say that water is essential for our survival, forgetting that it itself creates a survival issue whenever it takes a disastrous form like flood, drought, or any other water related issue. At a time like this, we always see the news showing how it destroyed the life and property of a newsroom, hindered country's economy and its operation, but it also showed how companies came forward and supported people. Therefore, my thesis focused on analyzing how these companies' stock return as get affected due to these water-related disasters. These disasters usually impact the same throughout the world, though its frequency varies. It impacts some regions such as India, Japan, and South Africa more than others. So I'll focus on these regions more than others. For this, I'll perform an event study analyzing how these water-related disasters impact the performance of the publicly traded firms, wherein I will also try to analyze its company stock, how it affects the company stock returns and its accounting performance. Afterward, I will regress these results with the company's, uh, company's uh, characteristics such as location, size, and leverage, and with other countries and industry characteristics such as World Bank water risk indicators and average daily use water used by the country per year. I hope to find the factors that have a long lasting impact and significant impact on the performance of firm. I will also try to mitigate, uh, analyze the effectiveness of the mitigation measures usually adopted by the companies during this situation. We also, uh, after uh, for this, I will try to use the databases such as emergency event database and the financial databases such as Bloomberg, Datastream, etc. After this, I will try to analyze if these factors have a long-lasting impact which we usually anticipated in these circumstances. Lastly, I will say that we always think for the people that's good, but we should also think for the companies because companies support thousands of families. So it's safe to say if we save one company, we save thousands of lives together. Thank you. Thank you, Parul. Our next presenter is Miriam Rizé from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Miriam is pursuing a Master of Applied Science in Civil Engineering. Her thesis title is Anaerobic Biodegradation of Hydrocarbons by Mature Fine Tailing Indigenous Bacteria. And her three minute thesis title is Bacteria Can Eat Oil. Good luck, Miriam. Imagine you're at petrol station and filling your car with the petrol. Some of the people thinking about the price, especially these days, is going high. But do you know the environmental impact of producing this petrol is more expensive than the petrol price? In Canada, there are lots of petrol producers. When they produce petrol, they generate waste. And this waste contains residual oil. They discharge it to the enormous storage pond. For sure, it has environmental impacts, especially for the birds. When they fly over it, they think it's a lake, they jump into it and cover their body with the oil and put their life in danger. Lots of money, energy, and chemical are spent to treat this waste. But what about the biological way? What about the green way? Yes, here is my research. 
I took sample from that waste and start my experiment in the laboratory. After days, weeks, weekends, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, and after a year, I found special bacteria. Why they are special? For two reasons. First, they can eat oil as their food. Really? Yes. My results show that they can eat 50% of the oil, the residual oil, only in two months. And the second result, they can resist at the bottom of the pond, even there is no oxygen there. Oh my God, really, they are special. But how they can help us, how they can help the environment. In a nutshell, when, we, when I took the sample from the waste, I found the bacteria, I identified them. But in the last step, I send them back to that waste so they can grow there, they can eat the oil and help the environment in the green way. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Our last presenter in the master's category is Diego Mendoza from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Diego is pursuing a master of science in chemistry. His thesis title is Development of Multimodal Imaging Probes Using Carbon Dots. And his three minute thesis title is Nanodiagnose. Good luck, Diego. Diagnosing diseases might be a challenging task. In order to do so, doctors use specialized instruments to get images of the inside of your body. This is also known as molecular imaging. But how do these techniques work? Well, in general, a technician will inject you a dye, and as it circulates through your bloodstream, this dye can produce a signal that can be uh, detected by an instrument and then translated into images. Then the doctor will take a look at the images and tell you if there are any abnormalities. But to get an accurate result, you need to be subjected to multiple techniques. This means that you're going to be exposed to different types of dyes. Well, these can be toxic. So um, uh, one way we can reduce toxicity is by using nanotechnology. So how? Well, nanotechnology, uh, in simple terms, is science conducted at the atomic level, where properties of the materials are unique. It is because of nanotechnology that now we have clothes that do not get wet. We can turn sunlight into energy. We can protect their skin from the sun. So basically, it can be applied anywhere. For my project, I want to apply nanotechnology in the medical field. I want to create this dye that can be used for two techniques at the same time. So how am I gonna do that? First, I created these extremely tiny particles that can glow when they are exposed to light. Um, these uh, particles have already demonstrated to be biocompatible, which means that they can be introduced into your body without causing any adverse effects. Um, they can be useful to, to get images of the cells. And what I'm trying to do now is to uh, incorporate metals in the surface of these particles so I can adapt them for a different technique. In this case, they will be useful to get images of the tissues. So by reducing the scale, I expect that these particles can access sites that cannot be accessed with a conventional dyes and they can last longer in the body. So we can make the dyes more efficient. And if we make dyes more efficient, we can reduce the dose needed to get the desired effect. So we can address the issue of, non, of uh, toxicity. So I believe that with this development, uh, doctors will be able to detect diseases even at earlier stages. So treatments can be prescribed before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. This concludes the presentations in the master's category. Thank you to all of the presenters for their excellent talks. We now invite you to take a moment to complete the Zoom poll and vote for your favorite master's presentation. 
We'll be back shortly for a little Q&A with our presenters.
Okay, welcome back everyone. While our judges deliberate to determine the winners, we will now have a question and answer period with our presenters. So again, if you have any questions about a presenter's research or the 3MT experience in general, please feel free to post them in the chat on Zoom if you haven't already. And we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. I'd like to start with a question that I'm sure a lot of people have. The 3MT requires you to throw technical language out the window when explaining your thesis work. How did you overcome this challenge? That was actually a pretty good challenge to overcome because along our careers in the undergrad, masters, then at the doctoral level, we are trained to use specific vocabulary to actually meet the, the demands of our committees, right? So, but at the moment that I wanted like to express about my work in the laboratory to other people, to my family, my friends, it was very, very difficult to actually ignite the same pride, excitement that I have of doing research. So overcoming that challenge actually helped me to find the right vocabulary in a way that they can like also enjoy all the fun that I have doing research. Yeah, that's what I would like to say. Thank you so much. Anyone else like to share? Um, the other thing I'd like to add is we had our th three sessions with our coaches from Concordia. Um, so obviously, uh, the first time around, it might be a little bit rough, and they'll say, we didn't understand anything at all. And then maybe the sec second time, say, OK, now it's starting to fit into our brain. Um, and then by the time we have our third in-person session, it's you get a pretty good idea. Um, but also, on the other hand, if you keep telling it to the same person, they might learn it too well, and they actually understand, which is not a fair representation of the average general public. Thank you so much. All right, we have another question. How do you plan to apply the skills you developed through your 3MT experience in other aspects of your life? Well, well, it's me again. I think that, to be honest, all these skills, I think I'm going to apply it on a job interview. I visualize myself like talking with psychologists, people who is outside of the research. And at the moment that I want to get higher, I have to be good at selling my skills, my knowledge, my points. So I think that also having uh, the tools in terms of a way to express all of that, it can play uh, in, and, and favor me during such interview. I think that that's how I'm going to apply it. Thank you. All right, we'll hear from DeRay as well. This basically helps in pitching ideas when you have to meet some investors and other things, and also improvise your presentation skills and also the stage fear. Uh, most of us, we have stage fear, and this helps. And uh, particularly, the coaches from diverse fields had improvised our stage. Uh, stage fear to come out and this thing. So I think this is a good platform to produce all those things and move moving forward. It would be a better idea. Thank you. Thank you, DeRay. All right, we'll hear from Simon too. Hi. I think uh, in the age of disinformation, also scientists are more and more required to face the media, but we're not trained as a media person or people in PR environments, or could be, or journals, but we're constantly asked by media, journalists, radio, to talk about our research. If we want the public and governments and any institution to understand our research, we have to, make, we have to really make it simple. And uh, that's what the 3MT is all about. So I think that helps. Love that. Thank you, Simon. All right. We have actually, yes. 
Go ahead, Maxine. So I'm gonna speak from a personal place. I think one day I'm gonna finish my PhD. <laughs> So we're told. Um, but as that time comes closer, I'm starting to wrestle more with the, the option of moving beyond academia into a public sphere. And this was like a first, like a real experience that we don't get much of, I think, in an academic kind of path to like really challenge ourselves to speak to, to non academics, if we will. Um, so I was really appreciative of that experience. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, we have a question here from the audience for Alex. The question is, in your experiment, how do you ensure that the music stimuli you create are neither too boring nor too complicated for your participants? Oh, right. So obviously we want a really objective measure for how predictable our stimuli are. And so the short answer is we use a computer. So we train an algorithm on a ton of uh, typical Western music, folk songs, hymns. Uh, and then that way we can take our new melodies that we make and pass it to that algorithm. And it can output how predictable every note is. So now we have an objective measure of how predictable it is. And then also we do pilot tests where we have participants online, listen to them and rate how predictable they think it is. So we have both an objective measure from the algorithm and also, uh, I guess, a more subjective measure or more ecologically valid measure from participants online. Interesting. Thank you, Alex. All right, we have another question here. What advice would you give people who are interested in participating in 3MT in the future, but are hesitant because they fear public speaking or are shy? Um, so, speaking as someone who had a breakdown during practice, um, because I'm just scared of public speaking, not that not everyone is, <laughs> see I'm literally having another breakdown now, I think what's important is just to try, because um, you, just with the practice and the experience, you kind of get a little bit more confidence in yourself, and um, yeah, and then you come out of this experience with something you know to talk about. Like I actually did this today, and I didn't have a breakdown. So it's just an experience that you can take with you, and you know, for future interviews and other situations where there will be more public speaking. So just try. That's my advice. Great advice. Thank you, Clara. All right. It looks like we have one more answer from Peru. So we'll hear from her. Uh, one thing I can assure you during these sessions that when you are appearing in the coaches, uh, in the coaching session with the coaches, you will learn, you will get every support from them. They will provide you feedback and you won't just get the feedback from them. You will get from your peers too because there is some feedback form we have to fill. I guess during that you will learn a lot and all the support you need. So I guess that will boost you up to come up here and talk about your thesis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Perul. I am now having word that we are almost ready for the moment we've all been waiting for, the announcement of our winners. But before I give the floor to the judges, let's give our participants one more round of applause for their amazing presentations today. We will begin with the Masters Awards. I would like to invite Susan Tantawi to announce the runner-up and winner in this category. Okay, so before I announce the winners, I just wanted to thank you all for your presentations, uh, thank the organizers for the event. I think it was very interesting listening to every one of your presentations, and I'm sure my fellow judges could agree that it was a really hard decision 
you know, it, it was hard to pick one winner and one runner up because you all deserve, you know, praise for all the hard work that you did. So excellent job. And I'll start off by announcing the Master Runner-Up Award, uh, which goes to Mariam Razari. Congratulations. And the Master First Prize goes to Amir Nizami. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I now invite Dr. Philippe Cagnon to announce the winners, the winner and the runner-up in the PhD category. Thank you, uh, and by the way, thank you to everybody who presented. You were absolutely wonderful. I'm very proud of every single person that was present and present. I know how courageous you are. <laughs> so uh, many, many thanks from Concordians and uh, from every uh, student that you uh, actually represented here. So without any further delay, the person who is the runner up for the PhD uh, category is simply Hashem Al Moussa. Hey, bravo. Thank you so much. You are wonderful. So it was it was a great presentation. You should be proud of you. Uh, the first prize and the person who uh, will also represent Concordia at the next step at uh, the Graduate Schools Association is uh, Maxine Yanucili. Thank you, thank you, Maxine. Very, very good competitors, by the way, that we had uh, this, this year. I'm very, very proud of you. And uh, finally, the person that will represent Concordia at uh, my thesis on 180 seconds, uh, it's Louis Mat Lazur. <laughs> bravo, Louis. Bravo, bravo. So now I think we're going to the other uh, level. So. Yes, I would like to invite Aiden Matlabi to announce the People's Choice Awards in both categories. Hi everyone. Uh, first, thank you for sharing your your thesis with us. And just to say, I know how nerve-wracking it is. I'm standing right here and I'm already freaking out. So you guys had a timer going on, and I'm I prefer going back to Afghanistan, dealing with Taliban, than being here. So saying this, amazing job. And like everybody says here, it was always very close call. But here is the vote from the peoples. So for the Masters People's Certificate Choice, Mariam Rezaris. And for a PhD People's Choice Certificate, Victor Cuiseda. <laughs> Please. So with that said, I'm going to step out of the limelight. <laughs> Congratulations, winners. And thanks again to all participants for sharing your research with us today. You are all fantastic. We'd also like to thank the judges again for generously offering their time and for accepting the challenge of deciding on the winners. We'd also like to send a special thanks to our 3MT guest coaches, Dr. Gina Beltran, Dr. Michael Fairway, and Rasha Sheikh Ibrahim. And a huge thanks to our grad pro skills coaches who are the ones working closely with our participants and, and they helped guide them to be in the competition ready state that you saw them all in today. So huge thank you to Christiane Meyer 
Eileen Holoka, Javier Ibarra Isasi, and Sylvie Wollett. We'd also like to give a special thanks to Rasha Sheikh Ibrahim, who is much more than a guest coach. She is the one working feverishly behind the scenes to make this event happen. So thank you, Rasha. And of course, we'd like to thank you all for being here with us today, encouraging the innovative research at Concordia University. It's great to have you here to share the research passion of our competitors. And last but not least, we'd like to extend a huge thanks to the incredible team at Fourth Space for their generous support and for hosting the event. This, in, this concludes our 2022 3MT competition, but we will be back in 2023 and we hope to see you next year as we continue to celebrate graduate research at Concordia. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Jessica Murphy, for such a stellar moderation here with us today. Congratulations. Congratulations to everyone. Fantastic job. What an inspiring afternoon. Uh, let's do this every Friday. What do you say? <laughs> oh, I'm getting some, <laughs> some nervous reactions here in the space. Anyhow, folks, we are so grateful for your time. We had such a huge audience here online joining us today um, and, and encouraging our participants via the chat, which we will share with uh, all the participants who weren't sitting in front of Zoom here today. So thank you so much for your participation and your encouragement. We really appreciate you. On that note, we're going to close up the Zoom and wish you a wonderful Friday afternoon weekend. We'll see you next year for this event. Bye. Take care, everybody. Bye.